Awesome. Well, it's uh, great to be here at the end of the day of a four o'clock when most of us are starting to fade just a little bit. Um, so I got a lot of slides we'll go through really quickly to keep us paying a lot of attention. Um, who's familiar with CNAP? Okay, so we got a few handfuls. So we got a lot of alphabet soup we're gonna do here. Um, that's the only acronym I'm gonna talk about today, and it's Cloud Native Application Protection. And we'll actually break that apart. So we're gonna take a look at, first of all, what are some challenges behind cloud risk today? Then we're gonna take a look at, at CNAP and what the act acronym actually means. It's an acronym coined by Gardner, but it's really just an aggregation of a lot of various technologies out there. And then we're gonna take a look at um, how do we actually take our cloud security platforms, how do we actually get our cloud builders to like it because there's nothing worse than building security solutions that do not get adopted. And that's really about democratizing it. So that's where we're gonna go through here in the next little bit. And you know, everybody remembers pretty much Christmas of last year when Log4j came out. Who was excited? Some people were, I were. I got some great images coming out of it that, that make some fun of things. Um, but it was proliferated through everything. It was in our containers, it was inside of our applications, it was in the ones that we created, it was in the ones that we got from vendors. Uh, this application was everywhere and it really just left a lot of questions of where's the issue? Right? If we have to fix something and we got a week before Christmas, where do we focus on? And, and really these are easy questions, right? Um, such as, where am I actually vulnerable? Am I at risk of this or am I not at risk of this? If I am at risk of this, where am I exposed? These are all questions that we, we can easily come up with, but it's really hard to try and understand where the actual risk lies. Because when we start at something simple like a vulnerability, that's easy to define. Um, anybody not have vulnerability scanners today? If you do, don't raise your hand. Because we all have them, right? And they give us these giant reports of data that we struggle to read through because we don't actually know where they're running. And even if we had that bit of visibility, we don't actually know if they're exposed to the public internet, right? This is a challenge that we keep running into as we navigate through security. And on top of that, I'd also like to know, especially in a cloud environment, where are my credentials? Where are my permissions? What's being exposed if I were to get breached in this case? And those are the things that we want to try and answer. So we have, you know, historically a security being really good at buying lots of solutions to do a lot of different things, right? We have our vulnerability scanning solution. We have our identity platform. We have, you know, different things to map our architecture out and maybe scan that. And, and as we take a look at this, all of a sudden these simple questions become hard to answer because I gotta look at all these tools, I gotta dive into all these answers. And that's where CNAP really comes in, right? CNAP is supposed to be an umbrella for all of this. And a lot of CNAP solutions on the market today, they will give you that ability to take all these various point solutions and wrap them into a single platform or a single solution. And, and that gives us the perspective that now when we take a look at what we're doing, we can start to take a look at things a little bit more holistically. And that would be where, when we actually take a look at something like this, in this case, I'm picking Wiz as an example here because I am with Wiz, so I should pick that example. When we, when we scan an environment, we'll actually see things like critical risks boil up. And this is because you're not looking at an individual risk, you're looking at that aggregated risk across the entire environment. But again, having all those different data sources allows customers to take those risks and remediate them a lot easier. Now that's easier said than done because we got a great DevOps world out there where we've got people developing, people got operating, and we keep going back and forth with this. So we have to implement these solutions, right? We can be great at implementing all these security solutions. We can be great at implementing IAM solutions and vulnerability management solutions and things from an audit perspective, things from a risk perspective. But as we continue to take a look at this, we gotta figure out how do we operationalize this? Right? So it's, it's easy to identify where those vulnerabilities might lie, but it's another one to understand what the actual risk of these vulnerabilities are. And this is where we work with our, our cloud defenders. We start to understand who would actually try and exploit, what would our risk be, what would our concerns be here. But we gotta bring this back to our cloud builders as well. And our builders are gonna have the access to actually make those changes, make those fixes, and implement them. So CNAP, again, it's the overarching product capability to deliver all those solutions. But we actually gotta understand how do we actually get this solution implemented? How do we more, you know, more importantly, actually get 
our builders to want to use a solution, right? There's a lot of things we want to do from security, but we get stuck actually trying to implement them. So first thing what we want to do is we want to find solutions that will actually get us full visibility across the environment without bothering anyone, right? If we can implement security tools without it causing an issue with our development team, that's great. The second thing we'll talk about is how do we actually prioritize what we're going to give them. If we tell them we wanted them to fix something, we should be accurate and tell them this is exactly what you should be fixing. And then we want to become proactive. I mean, the ideal world is, is fix the security issues ahead of them becoming an actual concern. So the first step in visibility is, is gaining that visibility without bothering anyone. Because that's where everything starts. If we, we can't protect what we can't see. We need to have that visibility. And when that visibility is complete, it has to be independent of the architecture, right? We don't want to necessarily put down on the business or developers, you have to do something a certain way. You want to do this completely without friction. You just want to implement it. You want to get that visibility. But we want to give as well before we ask. If we can give our developers security visibility without asking them to do a lot of things, again, it reduces that friction and it gets us that visibility that we're looking for. And we can do this in a cloud world pretty easily. We can connect to the control plane of the cloud. We can scan the APIs. We know what configurations exist. We know what you're running in the cloud. We know what concerns there might be. We can look at Kubernetes. Like All these things are accessible through an API. And from there, we can actually start to understand the services. If you're running a database, you want to know what that is. You want to know how it's used, what the security risks or concerns around that. But it also gives you the ability to start digging deeper. What are you running? Are you running cloud storage buckets? Are you running cloud databases? Are you running things like that? Or maybe we actually start to dig into the next level. What are your workloads inside of the cloud? Right? We need to get to that level of understanding what are you running? And it's easy to do. We can scan VMs. You can snapshot them. You can get that level of visibility of understanding what's running inside of everything in your environment, whether it be a virtual machine, whether it be Kubernetes, whether it be containers, it shouldn't matter. It's a workload. You need to get that visibility. And the same goes for the other side. If you're building containers, if you're doing things like that, you want to know what you're going to be putting into your environment. You want to have that visibility into your serverless functions. And that's how we get that full visibility across the environment. And if you do it right, you should be able to do it completely agentlessly. If there's no agents involved, you don't have to implement anything. You simply connect and you get that visibility. That's the ideal place where now we can get that visibility from you know, the entire stack and know our entire cloud ecosystem that we have out there with the full inventory. But as we take a look at that, we also want to make sure that if we're going to generate events, if we're going to give things back to our developers, we have to be ruthless about prioritizing them. Because if you send a ton of events over to the developers, I can guarantee you they're going to start ignoring what you're doing or they're just going to have a big list of work that they're still probably going to ignore because it's too much, right? We have to prioritize that. And the same goes for us as security. We should not tolerate the noise. If we see noise in a product that we're using, we should already not be sending those, right? We should be prioritizing them. And that's critical. We need to have that visibility into that. And that's a challenge where if we take a look at tools that just look for misconfigurations, we're going to start generating a lot of noise. And I'm going to pick on classic CSPM solutions here because this is what they do. A VM has a public IP. Is that good or bad? Right? It depends on what's next. If there's no network access, I don't really care. Right? Why should I get them to fix it? Because it doesn't really matter. Same goes for the other side. If we find a firewall rule that is wide open for SSH, should I worry about that? Initial gut might say yes, and this is going to generate a lot of noise, but the reality, it's not connected into anything that matters. Right? So that's the visibility that we get, but it goes the same way the other way. If we actually take a look at a VM that does not have a public IP, would that be a concern? It would be if it's connected to the public internet directly. Right? So those are the things that we want to understand and really take a look at misconfigurations in our environment do not equal risk. They're just misconfigurations. I mean, maybe there's best practices there, maybe there's controls, but it doesn't produce risk. And that's what we really want to start looking for. If we want to actually get effective exposure for risk, we need to understand what matters. And we do that by taking a look at the services. We do that by taking a look at what are we actually running inside our cloud environment. We know we have storage buckets, we know we have functions, containers, all those things running in there, but we start mapping them. 
we need to map them. How are they connected on the network? How are they connected to load balancers, to firewalls, to all the other controls and rules that we have in place to make our environment work? And as we take a look at that, we now know what is connected to the internet. And this becomes a graphing problem. If we can actually take all this information, we can start mapping back what is actually exposed. And now that we know what's exposed, we know what we need to focus on. We want to focus on that container that's exposed or that function that's exposed. And when we take a look at that, it's like, okay, great. We've done a good job. We have understood what that exposure most likely is. You want to have a way of validating this. And we'll actually go back and we'll actually take all those exposure points and we'll dynamically scan them. So that not only do we say all the configuration says it's wide open, we actually say it is wide open. We do get to your application. And this is where the developers, we can give that back to them and start to say, hey, this is your application that you did leave exposed. This is your Jenkins server that is running out on the public internet with no authentication. Well, and on top of that, cloud risk is complex. Right? And we need to take a lot more into account here. If I just take one element and I say, hey, you should worry about this, it does, still does not help me prioritize. Right? In this case, if we get an event that says, hey, we should be looking at something, we want to prioritize. We want to under know, un understand what the context is of that workload. Are there vulnerabilities there? Is there configurations or you know, exposed secrets as part of that instance? When we understand that, it gives us an element to prioritize with. We want to understand what the cloud context is. How is it set up? How is it configured? What is it connected to? Is there something that we should be thinking about there? Is it going to impact identities if this were to be exposed? And then lastly, we want to have that business context. So when we take a look at our cloud risks, you can see that these things become very complex very quickly. And that, having that ability to bring all this information and understand this is what you should be looking at within your CNAP platforms. Because now that we have that, we actually have that ability to prioritize and contextualize our events that when we see a combination like this that's a concern, we now have a toxic combination. This thing is something that's a must to follow up with. And that's gonna reduce the noise that we bring to our developers, and it's gonna give us a lot more flexibility to work with now. Because when we wanna work with our developers, we have to become proactive here. Um, you know, security should never delay dealing with a security issue if we can actually give them that high quality information. They can action it right away. We can actually enable the developers with context around this. We're not just giving you an alert and say go deal with it. We're giving you an option that says, hey, here's how you actually can handle it. Here's how you can look at your pipeline. Here's how it's connected into your environment. And that's because when you, when you start democratizing your platform, you can actually go to your builders and say, hey, you're looking after this application. Here's your security visibility for that application. Cloud gives us an immense amount of power around establishing projects and segments and tags and all these other kind of capabilities that we have. When we start mapping that, we can map that back to our developers as well and say, here's your security perspective on your environment. Give them the ability to remediate the security concerns and be ahead of the curve there. Again, if we can extend what we do on the security side to all our developers being part of that, we get to leverage that entire side of the business to support what we're trying to achieve. And I like to think of this about humanizing those security risks, right? So often security risks are just very cryptic security mindset. It's like, well, I'm not a security expert. It's like, well, you know, some of us might not be either, but we understand kind of how things tie together. So we know that this is a concern, but when we've humanized it and we actually can tell a developer, here's what happened, here's why it happened, here's why you should be concerned about it. It gives them that ability to understand that and follow through with that. And that's really where we can start to get to the next step, where we take security from just being a product on the side to something that's part of the way that we're actually running our solutions that we're delivering. Um, we can be part of the production side of things, where as we have our CNAP platform, it's connected to the cloud environments, we get that risk, we get that prioritization, we know those toxic combinations we want them to follow up with, we give that information back to them. And that way we can integrate with their tools, their workflows, our workflows, however we want to operate here. But we also want to give the ability to say, hey, there's certain things that just must never happen. Well, let's enforce them right away. Let's automatically remediate them. If you open that thing up and it should not be open, we should close it out. 
or maybe we actually give them that shared view. Now we can actually really start dividing and conquering what we do from a security and an operations perspective. But if we have all this understanding, if we know where our concerns are and we're remediating all of this, we can really start taking, you know, stop looking right at where things are at, but actually take that shift left and really say, hey, all these things, all these guardrails, the same things we're looking at in production, let's actually secure these things in the pipeline as we build things out. So that is, you know, my three steps to, you know, taking our security platform for the cloud, our cloud native application protection platform. I'll say that once more because I can. And hopefully everybody walks out with knowing yet one more acronym. Um, and as you have that, it, it's really, again, it's about getting that visibility. If we can have that visibility across the environment, everybody can have access to this, right? And it should be no effort. We do it agentlessly because it's the fastest way to get in and get it across the board. Having that prioritization of risk allows us to give that context. If we give that high quality alert to our developers, they can action it right away. And that's really, again, how we democratize this. We give them access to our security platforms so that all our developers actually become part of what we do from a security perspective. And I grabbed a few customer quotes that we got. Um, you know, again, they did pick Wiz, so I'll be transparent about that. But when you take a look at what they're saying, it's like, we got the least amount of pushback from our DevOps team, right? If you don't get that pushback, you get the adoption, you get the growth, you get the leverage there. Um, or you get the other one where it's like, hey, we're able to scale the cybersecurity team's reach within the organization. Um, we all wanna hire more security people, but they just don't always exist. We try and train them up, but what if we can actually bring that security and really leverage the development team in that? And that's really, again, in the security world, we have a lot of tools, we have that access to a lot of things, but let's try and consolidate that in the way that we actually bring a few solutions that are powerful, that allow us to really work with our customers and grow things. So with that, thank you for the time. And we are in the expo hall tomorrow. If anybody wants a demo to actually see this in action, definitely let me know, swing by, and I'll be around here the rest of the day. Thank you.